Hello and welcome back to Bombshells. I'm Flo Elizabeth. And I'm Amy Shepherd. And today we are joined by the assistant editor of The Critic, Joe Bartosz. Welcome. Hello, lovely to be here. <laughs> Thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, very well, thanks. Yeah, not bad at all. It's, uh, yeah, good to, quite excited to be here. It's, I've, I don't think I've um, met you until today, but you, I've followed a lot of the work that you've done over being a campaigner against the Gender Recognition Act. Mm-hmm. Yes. Is, am I right in understanding that? Yes, that's yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And um, basically being a bit of a turf. How do you, <laughs> how do you feel about that term? Um, I think it, it can be, I think it's very widely applied. So um, obviously it means you know, trans exclusionary radical feminist. Um, I do come from a radical feminist um, sort of background and that's my perspective on things. Um, so I think quite often... It's very widely applied, whereas actually radical feminism is about having a sex-based analysis of everything, mm. <laughs> effectively. Um, so you know, when it comes to when it comes to everything from um, I don't know surrogacy, prostitution, all of these things, I think are interconnected, and I think the thing that connects them is that is is that sort of sex difference. Mm. Um, so um, so that's sort of where I come from, and things. And oddly, quite often, I find myself agreeing with people across the political mm. spectrum because that's the my mm. primary dividing line that I'm interested in. Mm. Yeah. yeah, would you still describe yourself as a radical feminist? I don't know. Um, I just. At the risk of sounding like a queer theorist, I do think labels are rather limiting. <laughs> so, um, so I don't know. Um, uh, probably, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's 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 kind of just harnessed. If it's like you, if you can't beat them, join them. If you're gonna if they're gonna call you it, and then there's, I don't know. It's it kind of cuts out the crap. Kind of just go, yeah, whatever. Yeah, call me oh, that. Yeah. I'll use it. Yeah, I am that. So mm. just sort of like it gets that first bit of the argument out of the way with, so you can actually get to like the the meat of the matter yes. yeah. so I yeah. just go whatever yeah I am whatever you say whatever mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. um but um when it comes to things like the gender recognition act and trans ideology that kind of piqued me to the to the idea that um ideologies that appear to women or young women especially as your friend and the kind thing to do it is the most clever way of sort of slipping in misogyny as your friend yes. so um so that's one example of that and then you start to look to other areas and then you kind of and then you obviously you see prostitution or the normalization of they call it like sex work sex work's mm-hmm. real work and then surrogacy is kind of like the new kid on the block i mean it's not the new kid on the block but it's new in our consciousness and the debate after the trans thing so it's like yes. how would you explain the link between between that and that. Okay, Um, so I suppose ultimately it's about the commodification of women's bodies. It's about not seeing us as fully human, it's about seeing us as sort of the sum of our parts, if you like. So I think when that comes to the sex industry, you know, we've got this Madonna Hall dichotomy, which feminists talked about for a long time. Um, When it comes to the sex industry, that's, that's quite obvious. You exchange consent um, for um, for money, um, and I would often suggest that that consent isn't freely given. Um, it tends to come from a lack of options rather than a plethora of options. Nobody grows up thinking, "Oh, I know what I want to do." <laughs> it's I'll become a prostitute. Yeah. Um, similarly, when it comes to surrogacy, I think um, I think again, firstly, it's it's not only about the woman consenting; it's also about the the harms to the to the child. And I think with with both surrogacy and prostitution, not only do they um, depend on the idea of a sort of a mind-body split, of sort of splitting away from emotion, um, splitting away from the body in, in some senses and commercialising the body, which are all the sort of the end point of objectification, which again is something that feminists have talked about for a long time. Um, but I think um, you also have to think about the baby that's then, you know, not given their consent to be to be carried and ripped away from the person who gave birth to it, its mother. Um, so I think, and obviously they've both got huge industries behind them and a lot of money behind them. So the surrogacy industry at the moment is estimated to be worth around, uh, I think, $14 billion. Within the next decade, it's projected to be worth around $99 billion. And when it comes to transgenderism, obviously we now have a generations of of young people who have been sterilized thanks to transgender medicine and a lot of them won't have won't be able to conceive naturally and um, surrogacy will then present itself as an option yeah so I think these things are all very much interconnected and obviously when it comes to um, transgenderism 
the idea that uh, what a woman is is based on a, a set of sexualized stereotypes is is very patriarchal. It's, it's very sort of masculine, if you like. So I think in that regard as well, there's something that links these three massive social problems. Yeah, with the um, the idea, which I completely agree with, that a baby does not consent to um, sort of being a victim of surrogacy. Mm-hmm. Um, what is the what do the pro surrogacy advocates have, do they have an argument for that um, or do they not care or I think something that's quite interesting again about both transgenderism and surrogacy is they kind of have this sort of rainbow wash so I think quite often um, these things are sort of slipped through yes by playing on the socialization by playing on the idea that you know women have to be nice and kind and mm. and in a way it's the most sort of self-sacrificing thing you can do um, but I also think um, it's it's being sold as a way to you know help childless couples, particularly to help gay men have children. Um, and I think that sort of rainbow wash mm. and that sort of idea that every child is wanted is a way to bypass people's perhaps their moral scruples or, mm. or any misgivings they might have. Mm-hmm. So I think in that regard, the idea of uh, a woman being self-sacrificing and um, and it being uh, an altruistic thing to do um, mean that the child's consent and the harms to the child, which we're starting to learn more and more about, and indeed the harms to the mother, um, are sort of glossed over. Mm. I feel like we, um, I fear we've just gone straight into the... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, you know, I'm not the, making no, a small talk. No, 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 <laughs> not, not your fault. Um, yeah. the, the, the big issues, but I'm really interested what your journey has been into this, like... Where did you start? How was your journey to what you believe and do now? I mean, there's so many things I'm massively unsure about. Yeah. Um, I Which would is s- great. <laughs> <laughs> I wish more people would admit to that. Um, I suppose I started as, as someone who's very much on the left. Um, and I came into to writing um, as much as anything else through feminist activism. So mm. I <clears> ran a feminist group. I had a little column in my local paper as a part of that and then this issue came up my initial response because I hadn't long got together with with the woman who's now my wife my initial response was always a bit like homophobia and I was really really upset to think about sort of um uh to to recognize that actually the same harmful so-called gender stereotypes that I've been fighting as a feminist were the very same things that transgender ideologues rest their identities upon so when I sort of recognised that there was a massive uh, disjuncture there, um, I just started talking about it immediately because it just seemed so obvious to me. Um, mm. And then the reaction I had made me realise, and the more people sort of were outraged and horrified, the more I thought, well, this is clearly worth talking about. Mm. Um, so as a result of that, I started basically pitching on, on this topic. Um, and to start with, actually, one of the first places that published me was um, uh, the Morning Star, the paper for the Communist Party, somewhat surprisingly. Um, and then I believe they had some pushback from the unions mm. and um, and they stopped for a while publishing anything that was gender critical. The term mm. gender critical wasn't even around really at the time. Right. When was this? Um, so this was about 2017. Right. Um, and then obviously in the past few years it's become more and more of an issue and it's become sort of the main thing that I write on although I think it's part of a continuum of of other issues. Have you developed your opinions about transgenderism in any way? Have you hardened? Have you kind of... Oh, I've hardened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone does. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost become a bit of a stereotype that, you know, when people start with, they're like, oh, I'm not transphobic, but... Yeah, you have to preface anything, being like, this is good, and this is... Uh, Kemi Badenoch is uh, so guilty of this. And I uh, obviously I appreciate that she uh, is... She has taken a line that she is, but when she finishes off her speech and just like... And this is also beneficial to trans people. It's just like, do you kind of just use Kira Bell's name and then that phrase in the same in the same speech and I'm very uncomfortable with that so yeah I think hardening is kind of like I, to- I totally yeah I mean I know, I know what you mean on the other hand I don't I think it's such a difficult thing to talk about still I probably wouldn't criticize anyone who was in the public eye who does is brave enough to raise it because mm. the backlash is still so horrendous yeah. mm. um, but I do know what you mean it is frustrating when you think oh for god's sake you know there are two <laughs> sexes we all know this and trans isn't really a thing <laughs> I mean, yeah. Look at, look at what Sue Ellis faced after her speech at God, yeah. NatCon from conservatives. Yes, yeah, 
Like, yeah, nuts. I'm pretty horrified by um by Ian Dale in particular for for really gunning for her. Mm. Um, wow. Yeah, he's been he's been particularly unpleasant. I just um, think from members of her own party. Yeah, is really uh, disappointing because, well, obviously, in the Labour Party, which is now uh, the government, um, there's the one. Rosie Duffield, who will yes. really speak up. Yeah. But in the Conservatives, it's more the sort of the norm, you know. Mm. Rishi especially has, has kind of been quite brave in, in talking about it. However, have they done enough in this in their 14 years? No, I mean... To protect women? That's, that's what I find so irritating, is the way it's been sort of framed in these terms as, as left, right, right. Well, really, it's kind of cuts across that. Um, so it has been under the Conservative administration, it was under the Conservative administration, that every single institution was taken over by bloody Stonewall. Mm. Um, you know, it was it was government departments under the Tories that were paying money to them. I mean, thankfully, that, that was stopped after, actually, it was Liz Truss, I think, who really sort of put the kibosh on that. Um, but, yeah, they've they've been sort of asleep on the job. Um, for a very long time, um, and um, and yeah, I think um, I think they should feel bloody ashamed of what they've allowed to to happen. Um, and Labour missed an opportunity. I mean, they could have actually done something that was common sense, that had sort of grassroots support. Um, if they'd sort of cut through the narrative, the progressive narrative, because obviously it isn't progressive in any way. If they'd had the guts to stand up, and indeed, if Starmer could have perhaps apologised even now to Rosie Duffield, that would mean so much. But they won't, and they haven't, and they're spineless. Yeah, and we've got um, at least one term to look forward to of... Yep. Oh, I don't even want to think about the damage that will be done because, as we know, Labour can be in for a short term and then do a lot of damage in that term and then the Conservatives will come back in mm. and not reverse any of it. So. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think the Lisa Nandy thing with her sort of, you know, oh, all her goodness. being suddenly sort of considering her, you know, telling everyone that she's anti-cultural when she's been stoking so, it yeah. for years. Just like, she's mm. been one of the most... <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness! I mean, I know I just I just criticised Kemi, but I mean Annalise Dodds now as oh. taking over women and equalities. Have you seen her bio? No. It's written in they them. Is it really? Yeah. How have we got to a point now? I mean, I I think I was hopeful, and I maybe you were as well. In the last year, it seems to become more of in the public domain discussion about this kind of stuff. It's been more it, you feel more appropriate to actually say no. We need to we need to demand an answer to what is a woman. Can we get people in power to actually answer this? Um, but so so I thought that the tide was kind of changing, and normal people with normal common sense were going, okay, this does actually. I'm kind of understand. I'm getting my head around this now, yeah. and. There's, there's an issue here, but I can't... I'm working it out, but there's definitely an issue. People were very... But now we've got Labour in, and I'm worried that, that, that that's really now just changing the, the course of everything. How is that going to end up? Uh, well, it's impossible to say, isn't it? I mean, they have... They've, they've committed themselves to quite contradictory aims. So they've said in the manifesto that they want to reform the Gender Recognition Act and sort of liberalise the, um, uh, the process of changing... Um, I mean, I hate the term legal sex, but of changing, um, basically of falsifying birth certificates. Mm -hmm. um, so they've, they've... To make it all easier. Yeah, they have said they're going to do that. However, they've also said that they're going to protect women-only spaces. Well, you can't. <laughs> it's like you, mm. you can't do one without impacting on the other. Those things are mutually exclusive. Yeah. Um, and I think when it comes to um, the sort of broader idea of trans issues, I think a lot of the public are quite... Um, I mean, you know, s s surveys have shown, we've had polls that have shown they're kind of turned off the idea of trans politics when it's presented to them in those terms. If you ask them whether they want their mothers to go uh, into hospital wards with men on those wards or whether they want access to single-sex carers or for their intimate care to be performed by somebody of the opposite sex, obviously it's something that nobody bloody wants. Um, so I think when it's framed in terms of just ordinary sex-based rights, people understand it as a common sense issue. When there's this sort of obfuscating, highfalutin nonsense around gender identity, I think it puts people off and they get a bit scared. Yeah, 
Yeah, but it sounds so kind of high level academic almost yeah. that people shy away from it and go, oh, well, that sounds far too complicated. I don't, I'm not really interested in reading up about it. Or, yeah. Okay, whatever. Yeah, and I mean, I was, I was chatting to my hairdresser, weirdly enough, the other day, and she was like, oh, it's all a bit complicated. And I was like, it's not. It just <laughs> made you believe it. Yeah. So, so they can sort of wiggle it around and go through the back door, really. Yeah. Because they've just gone oh no no we, we know what we're talking about so you're going to throw loads of terms at you that that you don't you haven't heard of before but they're all all i got really really good academic scrutiny over right mm. okay <laughs> it's better like, trust the experts yeah. who are basically <laughs> being paid to push this nonsense <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah yeah it's just such a privileged position to take especially when labor is supposed to be the party that represents the working man mm-hmm. woman yeah. um which a lot of the people that will suffer from men being in women's spaces will be, you know, low paid hospital staff. Yes. Who, if they have a big beefy guy in a woman's ward trying to do whatever, they're going to be the ones having to pull him off yeah. and deal with it. And these are also the people where they've got much bigger issues like how am I going to pay my rent how am I going to mm. feed my kids they don't mm. really care about trans issues but when it will affect them who's going to stand up for them that's what that's yeah. what I find really scary um, and I, I worry that women who are at the bottom echelons of society won't have the confidence in their in their own feelings yeah. and their own um they they they, yeah, they won't. They but basically won't feel that they can back themselves with their um, with their intuitions and how yeah. they're how com- how uncomfortable they would be to actually voc and vocalise that. Yeah. And say, I'm not okay with um, a bloke being next to me in an in intimate space, yeah. or uh, such as a hospital, and I, so it, and then and then obviously, I think the luxury classes can pay for their own spaces yeah. mm. they can they, they've got that option and they, they if they don't like the intimate carer they're being given if that's if they if they're uncomfortable with with a man turning up to intimately wash them then then they can uh, luxury classes can just pay f- for it for, yeah. f- for a difference uh, whilst they're doing the damage like people like David Tennant yeah um you know obviously it's a tough situation if he really believes that his son is what non-binary. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, as a parent, like I assume, you just want to protect your child, them to be happy, them to feel comfortable. But what he's doing is damaging, and yeah, he's not going to face the consequences for it. No, no, it is very much a sort of luxury belief, um, something sort of that. Um, well, you know, when you look at the amount of children of Hollywood stars that identify as non-binary or trans, it's yeah. it's totally a sort of. Can we study that, please? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's absolutely a a thing, isn't it? And I think that also gives it a a, a status that it doesn't deserve as some sort of um, yeah, as a sort of. Um, somehow it casts those who who object to it as as being ignorant or as being backward or as being bigoted um rather than actually as people who can just you know are prepared to tell the truth i think um that that is um a luxury that is afforded to those who don't have to worry about you know putting food on the table yeah i think it's just a perpetuation of the sexist trope of women be nice be kind move over make space for the other person and it's and it really is just the embodiment of that and then a permission for everyone to ignore women and what drives me mad is that when the 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 toilet issue is raised like it's just toilets it's just toilets like what how many rapes are going on in the toilets it's like Mm. well you've kind of just you've just missed the whole fucking point of (laughs) <laughs> of dignity yeah we, mm. uh, so it's like th- the women's dignity and the right to feel comfortable and safe just to feel safe or comfortable is that not enough for you yeah. is that not a reason enough and it clearly isn't mm, yeah because they don't these men don't understand jonathan willoughby otherwise <laughs> known as india um is always tweeting uh you know how many women are actually like 
oh, they used to use this thing like washing their underwear in the toilets or something. But he won't understand what it's like. No. Unfortunately, GB News have a gender neutral toilet. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and last time I was there, I had this wrap dress on and it was like unwrapping basically and I went into the toilets thinking right I'll just stand in the mirror and adjust this but it involves kind of having to undo it and do it again and I just kept having to stop because men were walking in like this is you know it sounds like a small thing but the embarrassment and the um, vulnerability that having men in your space brings uh, is a big thing yeah and I mean it, yeah it, it sounds like a small thing but in countries where there aren't women only toilets and where there aren't women do get raped and assaulted so you know in India it's where, the, where there's sort of poor sanitation generally mm. in rural areas um, it's quite common for women to be raped when they're trying to do a poo as it happens because they have to sort of walk away from, from where they are where there yeah. isn't sanitation that's why um, um, well it's the Victorians who sort of Victorian feminist campaigners pushed for women-only toilets so that women could take their place in public life. Um, it was called the urinary leash. It was this sort of idea that women were sort of couldn't leave the home too far because they wouldn't be able to use the loo. Um, oh. So, you know, that, that actually, it sounds like a trivial issue, but there's actually quite a long uh, history of women struggling mm. to get that and to have that recognised. And to just mm. dismiss that as something irrelevant is... Um, Mm -hmm. is kind of real high-handed, unpleasant um, behaviour. And, yeah, I mean, it's... it's. I think there's something as well that I think... So I, it's a bit of a pet topic of mine because I'm writing a book about it at the moment that relates to, to pornography with this as well, in that, um, firstly, a lot of men have fetishes for, for doing this sort of thing, for invading women's spaces, for even using the loo of women, listening to them wee, stuff like that. It's weird, but it's a thing. It's a thing. Mm. Um, and secondly, it's about women's boundaries. And I think mm. pornography obviously suggests that women's boundaries are there to be pushed, to be violated, to be ignored. And I feel the same sort of mindset is common amongst trans activists, that, you know, women's boundaries don't matter, their, their no doesn't matter. Their, I feel like there's something, there's a commonality there just about um, sort of dehumanising, dismissing women. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see the reduction of women to sort of pornographic body parts. Just, it, well, not in all, all cases, because you don't just... To, to have a to sort of have a fetish or a kink to dress up as women, you don't... Some, some don't do it visually pornographically. Some of them just do it in their own subtle way. But... Um, but um, but on the whole, why did they always have massive <laughs> fake breasts? Yeah, it's just like <laughs> um, it's it's it's. It's, it's surely the giveaway. It's surely the giveaway. Well, I mean, all of it should be the bloody giveaway. I mean, we used to know that cross dresses were a thing, and they did it because they got off on it. And suddenly, mm. it's been forgotten because it's not politically correct to remember it. Well, how mm. guilty is Bruce Jenner of normalising it? Well, because he started off just cross dressing. Yeah, he did, and it was um, it's twenty fifteen, wasn't it, when um, when he sort of did the Vanity Fair cover and was sort of named Woman of the Year. I mean, that just says everything mm. that you know. It's it's uh, just in every way, these are better women than us, aren't they? Mm. Um, and I do think that's a, a subtext as well that sort of runs through a lot of it. Um, he has, I think, come out. You know, obviously as an athlete, and said that um, he believes in in single sex sports, mm -hmm. which you know great it's a pretty low bar thanks thanks Bruce <laughs> um, but you know it's something um, but um, yeah I think actually that front cover did do a lot to put the issue um, in the public eye but I think actually for decades there have been lobbyists of borrowing away at institutions and trying to get this sort of normalised. Um, I think something as well that I think gets underestimated is just how driven men with the fetish can be. So you've got someone like uh, Foucault, who, you know, was obviously had some... Um, um, upsetting thing, yeah. Well, yeah. Allegedly. Allegedly, indeed. Um, and um, and oh, he he birthed an entire movement based on normalising that. And a lot of the sort of queer theorists um, had similar proclivities or were reported to, and um, and also you know fed into this academic movement, which has now normalised something quite dangerous for women in particular, and indeed for children. So, I think yeah, I think sort of I mean, a lot of. Um, People on the right, particularly, will sort of look at feminists and go, "Oh, well, you know, well, you started deconstructing gender stereotypes and sex stereotypes, so it's your fault." But actually, I think when you look at the vested interests and how many men are getting off on this, it's not women's fault. <laughs> yeah. So, it's you think it's driven by the men with the fetishes, but they don't have that 
much power. They're not oh. really. <laughs> yeah. Or Let is the w that because I, I was thinking, surely there's a financial incentive to this, which I can see in America where they're making money off the drugs, they're making money off the surgeries, they're making money off the therapy when the drugs and the surgeries don't make the people happy. But in the UK, I don't get that so much because it's not, you know, big farmers not so big here. I mean, I think it's a globalised thing, isn't it? Mm. And I think, you know, initially you could look at the pornography, the sissification pornography that men are looking at that may, means they want to, you know, they get bored of looking at mainstream porn, so they end up sort of in these weird rabbit holes that then lead them to um, cross-dressing and then to uh, autogynephilia and these sorts of things. I mean, actually, I think around about 3% of men have always been quite into cross-dressing. Stop. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, it's always been a very common thing. Um, I know so this is like, men. Uh, yeah, there we go. So yeah, <laughs> it's um, so you know, it's 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 something that has always been sort of running along in the background. This has just supercharged it, basically, right, and okay. I think pornography has supercharged it. And then obviously now it's it's not a kink; it's an expression of who they are. Mm. And um, yeah, so I think it's a, a global thing. And obviously, you know, with the surrogacy thing as well, I think that that mm. feeds into it. So mm. yeah, I think there is a lot of money to be made of it on a on a global scale. I think within the UK, I think we just adopted the narrative. Yeah, we tend to follow them, don't we? With surrogacy, then, um, it's not legal here, is that right? Sort of. But there's loopholes. Yeah, so um, I think there's the Surrogacy Act, it was uh, 1985, and basically it said that commercial surrogacy was illegal, as it is across the EU, um, but uh, you could do altruistic surrogacy, and that means that you can be compensated or given expenses. So that then opened the door to um, lots of agencies who charge people to be members and they charge around about five grand or so for membership or, and then um, to match them up with a surrogate, they charge again and then the surrogate will get rewarded with, um, sometimes it's just sort of like a, a monthly payment of expenses but generally that's sort of sounds like a a, wage to me it, yeah it is it's a bloody wage of course it is and sometimes that can be tens of thousands so i think 2018 i think there were five cases that went through the courts and they averaged out at about 60k that was being charged per pregnancy so you know there, there was a lot of money that can be made from this and is being made and then they also get incentives like um uh, little holidays or vouchers or so yeah it is a, in effect it's commercial surrogacy just mm. without the without the label it's considered mm. altruistic and I think we're totally banned it so I think France has totally banned it Germany's totally banned it Italy's totally banned it um, I think in Greece they're quite liberal on it and I don't know if they allow commercial surrogacy but I know that in Crete last year there were a load of they basically found a, a trafficking ring of surrogate mothers wow. In where, sorry? Crete. Crete. Um, who had been trafficked from all over the world and basically forced to give birth. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. And in the UK last year, there were three reports to an anti-slavery charity of the same thing happening here, of oh women no. being basically forced to give birth, forced to be pregnant. Why am I surprised that there's another um, thing that only really rich, you know, the, what you call the luxury class, can afford that uh, dehumanises women? Mm. <laughs> yeah. What's going on there? Yeah. You're Funny turning me into a radical feminist. Because, <laughs> yeah, when, once you look at it in really, really plain ways, quite blunt ways like that, it really, it's really hard to unsee the comparison between surrogacy and basically prostitution. Yeah. yeah. There's just, it's just got different themes. But with surrogacy... Do you believe there are different kinds of surrogacy? And if there are, say, say if you had maybe a sister mm. hold, carrying your baby for you or outsourcing to a stranger, do you see it? It's hard to actually distinguish. I know, I, know, I know what you're asking and I know what you mean. And there are tricky, trickier areas. I'm not saying it's, you know, it's all as morally reprehensible as, as commercial surrogacy. But at the same time, I think it's a little bit like the arguments around euthanasia. You might feel on an individual level some sympathy, but I think if you legislate to allow that, you end up with it being exploited. So um, I don't think there's a way to allow a sister to give birth for her sister or her brother or whatever, um, and, you know, to carry, even though there's sort of a genetic link there, I don't think there's a way of legislating to allow that to happen without opening the door to exploitation because you never know what's going on in those families. So tricky though it is, I don't, you know, there's no bright line. I, I realise there's sort of grey areas, but I think when it comes to the law, it's got to be clear. Mm. Mm. 
Do you think there's any chance that um, surrogacy in the UK will become like it is in the USA? Yeah, so I think in most states in the US, commercial surrogacy is a thing. I mean, it's a huge lobby, so I think there's every possibility. Um, yeah, and we do tend to sort of follow their suit when it comes to... Um, and also, because it's been sold as progressive, and we've now got a government that's come in that will want to sort of style itself as progressive, I think there's every chance they might buy into it. So, yeah, I think it's one to watch. Mm. I'm sure there's th- this is very long, but if you could give the biggest risks and the biggest concerns about surrogacy for anyone that might not be convinced that's watching um what are the worst things to do with it okay so when it comes to um gestational surrogacy so that's when you have you basically go through parts of the ivf process and you have somebody else's Mm -hmm. so to stimulate your your hormones and you have somebody else's um embryo implanted inside you so it's not genetically related to you but you're carrying it but you're carrying it um we know that there's uh, double the risk of, of serious complications during pregnancy. So you're more likely to miscarry, you're more likely to get preeclampsia, you're more likely to get gestational diabetes, all of these sorts of things that are, are pretty horrible. Mm-hmm. Um, which, you know, isn't surprising really because of course the body will try and reject it. Um, when it comes to um, more traditional forms of surrogacy where you use your own egg, so there are, um, you know, essentially you could be giving up your child that, you know, that you've carried that's genetically related to you in the delivery room, pretty much, you know, in the delivery suite. That's generally when it happens. And then at the moment you have to apply for, um, or the, uh, the parents, intended parents rather, not the parents, have to apply for a uh, parental order. Um, and that, I think it takes about six months or so. And that sort of cooling off period at the moment does allow some mothers to say, actually, no, I'm going to reject this and I'm going to take my baby back. And some have been granted that, which just goes to show some do actually change their minds about this. Um, but yeah, I think just that idea of, you know, we, we don't, puppies, you know, when you buy a puppy or you buy a kitten um, and you go to a breeder, um, no one would sort of rip it away after immediately after birth or, or you know, you, you, you wait six weeks. Yeah, with babies, apparently it's fine. I mean, that's pretty horrible. Um, and also in the UK, since 2019, we've allowed single men to, um, to use the surrogacy process. Um, and um, across the world, there have been cases where paedophiles have oh brought God. children to order. And this is going to become an increasing problem. I mean, it's happening now and it will... As the industry grows, it will become more of a threat and more of a problem. Because we have basically objectified women down to extreme reductionist kind of yeah. in, in ways, we've now lost the meaning of motherhood. Yeah. So what does it actually mean to be a mother? And the kind of sanctity of that and and then the meaning of being a woman as well with, the, with mm. gender ideology, but like when when we've reduced it down so much to just sort of a, a commodity that you can use and buy and it's a transaction like is there any i don't understand how it's like they can't define these things you can't you can't I, i'm slightly different on um the definition of mother i would naturally say someone that's given birth to a child but then ad- adoptive mothers i think they are just as much of a mother i'm going to be really really harsh i th- oh com- disagree with me completely if you <laughs> if you do i think i think it's sort of kindnesses like that which are understandable and i totally get but i think it's that sort of accommodation um and i'm not saying we shouldn't do it i'm not saying you shouldn't call adoptive mothers mothers of course they are but I think there is something there in that sort of um, widening out of language that mm. can be potentially dangerous and can yeah. be used against us. Right, so having an official definition of someone that has given birth. But, yeah, I kind of I almost think like you need... we can... Oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, well, sometimes I think about... Woman. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's really tough. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah cause the, the, cause then we're on to like, the legal protection of it. Yeah. So with... Um, so if you, I mean, if you go and research surrogacy, it will say that the legal mother will be 
the wait, oh, so oh, wait, what am I saying? So like the, the the yeah, with surrogacy, the, the if legal you give, mother is to give if birth. I if you were my surrogate mm. and you used my egg and my partner's embryo in you. Mm. Am I the mother or are you the mother? No, exactly. It's 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 like rewriting nature, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It's um and and you know that does seem to be something that's happening, um, in a broader sense for sort of getting rid of redef- redefining or getting word, rid of the word mother. So there was a case in um, yeah. Germany that not, not that long ago where somebody wanted to be taken off her child's birth certificate as a mother because she didn't identify as a woman. Oh, stop. And you're just like, well, it's not all about you. It's also about the bloody baby. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But truth, obviously, tr- truth can be very inconvenient. Yeah. And people aren't going to like truth all the yeah. time, and they're going to wish that the circumstances are different. And obviously, in in the case of a of an adopted parent who will no doubt love the child, but the fact is they aren't. Yeah. The 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 parent. Yeah. And so legal documents do have a role to represent truth, even mm. if it's inconvenient, um, in my opinion. <laughs> no, I, oh, I quite agree. Adoptive yeah. mother. Yeah. yeah. Adoptive mother is fine. Yeah, yeah. So I, I know, um, I think it was a little while ago now, Georgia Maloney um, put through a piece of legislation that was massively criticised. And to start with, my gut reaction was, that's terrible. And it was so that when uh, lesbian couples had children... Um, the father would have to be named or they couldn't both be on the birth certificate. I don't think that's necessarily the right way of doing it. Maybe you need two certificates. Maybe you need one that's the sort of, you know, the, the genetic, legal, medical one. Because apart from anything else, with the sort of advances in, in genetics, it would be quite useful to know where you come from. Yes. So maybe you need sort of a, a, a state one saying, you know, you're both legally recognised as this, this child's guardian, as its, as its mother's, as its parents or whatever. But at the same time, I think it's important to have that medical record as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I think there could be scope there for perhaps a legal and a, and a medical difference, mm-hmm. potentially. I don't know. Where do you stand on sperm donors? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel... I feel <laughs> What's the main arguments for and against? So I do think that a child has a right to know where it comes from. Yeah. And um, I think, you know, for for people who enter into those arrangements, I think ideally you really do need to keep the the father in its life if if, if you can. Mm-hmm. Um, Have you seen the new Netflix documentary, The Man with a Thousand Kids? Oh, I've heard about it, I but I haven't seen it. I watching it last night. Um, he's an absolute psycho, isn't he? Dutch chap. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We can watch it tonight. Yeah. Um, and... Yeah, I won't spoil it for anyone that wants to watch, but uh, he started off being in the kids' lives and then you can't be in a thousand kids' lives. What's a busy man? Yeah. <laughs> Suppose he had time to. You know, plenty of men aren't even in their kids' lives when they've got one or two. But, mm. yeah. um, but I think having yeah. that option is probably quite yes. important. I agree. Um, having said that, there are an awful lot of useless men out there, so... <laughs> but the the answer to that is for them to become useful men rather than yeah, yeah, yeah. absent <laughs> men. Yeah, totally. Um, um, but are there pros to it? Well, yeah. I mean, if it allows people to form families in different ways, you know, women in particular, to you know, loving uh, lesbian couples who want to bring children into the world, I, I don't have as much of an issue as that as I might perhaps for. Uh, gay male couples using surrogates mm. because apart from anything else there's a genetic link so yeah and what about a single female using a sperm donor I don't know to be honest if she thinks she can afford it and work <laughs> and have a child all power to her but um, but I think it's it's a tough ask I think it would take a particularly um, well supported woman to be able to do well, that plenty successfully plenty of single mothers by circumstance yeah and and all power to them. It's not easy. I think to actually actively go into that with your eyes open. Phew, bloody hell. Yeah. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's. I think that it's uh, really well. Looking at studies, it is uh, not that I'm citing any, but I have seen <laughs> studies, um, which I hope no one calls me out on that. But uh, that say having two parents, whether that's two dads, two mums, a mum and a dad is 
so much uh, better for your outcomes in life yeah. than just one parent. Obviously, there are going to be circumstances, but I think that is another danger of using a sperm donor is um, choosing to raise a child mm. on your own is not the best decision. No, and I mean, but, to be honest, a child is never really raised on its own, is it? There's generally yeah, a network yeah, yeah. around it, so, but, yeah. Um, yeah. But that's kind of probably the, the least concerning this whole yeah. crazy situation. Yeah, with surrogacy, I... I compl- It made me change my mind on a few people that I've been quite a fan of, like Paris Hilton, because I just... One day was just on Instagram looking at her photos just looks like you know the beautiful stick insect she is but she then popped up one day I have a baby and <laughs> I was like giant where head. did your I thinking, where did your bump where was your bump yeah mm. where did you get where did this baby arrive from and and the Kardashians are all at it. Yeah. yeah. And Chloe Kardashian said that she... Oh, she didn't feel a connection. Couldn't connect yeah. her child. Who was Wonder the one? Why? There was one who didn't name their kid for six months, wasn't there? Was that her? I don't know. Yeah. I think I was just like... I think that was <gasps> her. Which probably, you know, that's the first thing in a UN charter on the rights of the child is a child has a right to a name. That is, is so fundamental. Just like, how could you be so dismissive? Just... Yeah. Ah. Yeah. I just don't think anybody is going to naturally, instinctively care... And want to love a child like the mother. No. Yeah. I just don't Do you know who else did it? I don't know if you watched Main Chelsea. Ollie and Gareth Locke. Ollie yeah. and Gareth Locke. And they um they were posting all these Instagrams like our wonderful surrogate and she was posting sort of pictures with her bump and she's got two sons as well and they were like feeling the bump and I just think ah, oh, like all that even the sort of anticipation in her family like there's going to be a new baby but the hormones that her body's preparing her to raise this baby and then have it taken off her it's like (sighs) awful no money must be able to no no make that worth it and i've I've heard uh, that some women almost get i know it sounds a bit ridiculous perhaps a bit tangential but almost get a bit addicted to it to the process mm. of being a surrogate and to giving birth and I, I can't help thinking that's probably trauma bonding isn't it that's probably mm. repeating the pattern to mm. get a different result to get which is oh, tragic it just yeah. Yeah. there's also the risk that if I don't want to say if something's wrong with the baby if there is an abnormality or they do the test to see if the baby has Down syndrome and then the intended parents don't want that but um the surrogate chooses to continue the pregnancy. Yeah. Wow. That's happened. Yeah, it does happen. And she's yeah. not only got a baby that she wasn't prepared to have, she loses the compensation. Wow. And it's probably a child who's going to need, take have additional needs. So yeah. it's like just this. I know that's why the law in Thailand was changed. Right. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I think they're sort of going back, actually, to a system of commercial surrogacy. Mm. But um, there's an Australian couple... Um, who bought a baby and then rejected it when it had Downs. Wow. And, um, and yeah, I mean, apart from anything else, I think there's a real role for, 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 um, I'm not, I'm not opposed to, you know, I'm, I'm pro-choice and all the rest of it, but I do think that society is stronger when, when you have a variety of people and you, you care for mm. people who, who need care. I think that's something very bonding, very yeah. useful, very... It's just discrimination. And Iceland, I believe it was was uh, priding themselves on um, that they'd eradicated Down syndrome. They hadn't. They'd eradicated people with Down syndrome by aborting 100% of them. And that... I used to be a nursery teacher and one of my classes had a little girl with Down syndrome and she was the most, like, beautiful, happy, like, joy of the class. And I just thought, the fact that someone thinks you shouldn't exist because you have an extra chromosome... Yeah, but do they? Is there has there have there been cases where it's been the wrong sex as well of the baby? Yes, yeah, that has happened. Um, I, uh, well, particularly in the states, um, I know it's happened. Um, I know there was um, a woman in the states who compared having the wrong sex embryo implanted to rape <laughs> because she had a boy in her, and she was yeah pretty bloody oh horrific goodness. and that's what she tried to argue in in the court <laughs> do 
just obscene. <laughs> yeah. And then on another level, when I see people like Paris Hilton, sort of, so she's lying down on a hospital bed in a hospital gown. Bear in mind, she's oh, yeah. no, it's, it's all for Instagram, Mandela, isn't it? <laughs> she's not. She's not given. She's not given birth. Had any medical procedure? She's lying mm-hmm. down in a hospital bed in a hospital gown. The mother is obviously separated. Is in another room next door. You can't see her. She's gone. The baby is being brought into the room, and then Paris has to lie lies there. It's all for her TV show, mm. and then. And like gets given the baby and she has to, she's like, oh, just pretend I've just given birth to it. And I just think, what qualifies you as a mother? Genuinely, genuinely. I don't Mm. care if that's your embryo or whatever. What qualifies you as a mother if you're not prepared to go through holding your child and giving Mm. birth to it? If, 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 If that's too much bother for you to actually bring, primarily bring your child into the world which is the most natural thing in the world. Yeah. I, I just what If you're not prepared to sacrifice your yeah. figure, you've got a big shot coming of how many sacrifices <laughs> being a mother is going to. You don't are you surely yeah. you don't deserve that baby if you can't be bothered to go through that. And I know there's some pe- people that might have health issues and they desperately want a baby and I really feel for anyone that's like, that's like that. Because um cuz that would be all, I, I, if that was me I'd be devastated, but the fact is there's a celebrity trend to just choose to do this. And then so uncomfortable with it because it's just so so corporate and commercial and yeah. I, I, it, it, it honestly makes me more angry than I actually want to admit. <laughs> no, 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 no. I understand. I mean, it's sort of like I, I remember like years ago there was outrage about um, celebrities having sort of like handbag dogs and this trend of having like you know pets that that match their image, not because they loved them, not because you know it was, it was in the shelter, just because they sort of match their image. And it feels like the next step on from that is treating a living being, only this time it's a bloody human. As, as an accessory, as something to sort of, you know, as the ultimate lifestyle brand to go with your, your sort of just horrible, absolutely mm-hmm. foul. You can have a, wait, what would be the ultimate? A handbag dog, a surrogate baby and a trans child. <laughs> yep. Tick all the boxes. Well, <laughs> you are woman of the year. Um, obviously, it's a global problem, surrogacy, but if we can, as the UK, do something to prevent getting worse or um what can be done to prov- to fix the problem or stop it getting worse so i think we need to open our eyes to the size of the lobby and to how influential and powerful and how much sort of how much vested interest there are in sort of promoting the idea of surrogacy of normalizing it i think we absolutely need to strip away the idea that this is in any way a gay rights struggle it, it isn't um, and I think that will be and is being what, what's used to push it and to promote it and to normalise it. So, you know, if you d- disagree with that, then clearly disagree with gay people having kids. They'll sort of, mm. no, <laughs> it's like everyone can adopt. Um, Do you think there needs to be a push for adoption? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because it's such a big thing in America and here it's just like yeah not talked about that much you know it is it is odd yeah um and i mean it sounds harsh but not everyone has a right to a kid i mean you know yeah. <laughs> um it's 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 i, I do it does sound harsh it does but it's life yeah i mean you know i'd, I'd quite like to be six foot mm. <laughs> <laughs> i mean you know shit happens um it just yeah um i do think people sort of need to accept their lot a little bit more perhaps and um when it comes to when it comes to the law, I think we absolutely need to tighten up and just stop altruistic surrogacy um, and, yeah, put the brakes on. Make sure that, um, at the very least, make sure that parental orders stay in place so that mums have a chance to, to change their mind. Um, and, um, and yeah, I do think, so at the moment, there's um, an exhibition in the Science Museum and it's just got a sort of piece on surrogacy with no nothing about the downsides it's just got a thing about the positive experience of the surrogate mother mm. and that will be funded by our taxes exactly mm-hmm. so i think there is you know just this lazy idea that somehow it's just technology it's just progressive it's just mm. that we need to really push back on an ideological level as well as the legal stuff that needs to happen mm. going back to the um the gender recognition act and it's embeddedness in today <laughs> I think um, I think that the argument that we can only criticise um, the idea of trans women 
or gender ideology, we have to do it in a polite way, um, is is just so unhelpful. It's like that. I oh, sorry, I'm I'm being so verbally incontinent because I because I feel so passionate and I can't get my words out. Okay. So I'll just um I'll just say I was at this I was at this discussion and we had a panel. Um, my full starter was there, which is amazing. It's the first time I met her and um, Claire Fox, um, Ella Whelan was there, and 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 then the discussion was about using pronouns or there's a why basically it was framed like have we lost the ability to be polite and be a bit um have we lost our manners when it comes to, to discussing this and stating like i was like this is exactly why we're here in the freaking first place i'll tell you who's lost their manners is the people trying to get in our toilets yeah <laughs> i was like come on manners are about boundaries fuck anything else i mean yeah. <laughs> yeah you would and i just thought we're, this is exactly the kind of mentality and the type of silly argument which means we're here in the first place because women have just been expected to be so polite and go, oh, you're, you're, you say that you, you need these rights and you need these things taken to let you live your life and then you, they just think of themselves second and by the time they've done that they've gone oh shit you're in my space yeah. and you you've got my rights and you've got my legal identity and it's too late oh hold on there's a big issue and i forgot about my boundaries so um so you'd never expect a man to demand his rights whilst being polite no. and a sort of apologizing for doing so yes. um so what would you say to people that you, that would say you just have to be a bit more reasonable sounding, be a bit more agreeable <laughs> about this? You know, if you're not going to use the pro, uh, pronouns, do it in a in a polite way. Mm-hmm. What would you say? Sort of. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I've uh, in, in my own writing, I have always been very clear about using sex-based writings, and I have done for years. Mm. Um, sometimes it gets edited and changed without my say-so, depending on the outlet. Um, and then I have to sort of make a decision, you know, I have to think, well, you know, is it more important that it goes out? And um, essentially with something that I'm uncomfortable with, is the story that important or do I push back? And it's quite a tough call at times um, because, of course, all newspapers have guidelines about, you know, what they allow and what they don't allow. And you think, well, sort of the first part of the editorial code is is about um, uh, accuracy in reporting. Mm. So you think, well, really, <laughs> that that that's it's totally at odds with everything. Mm. Um, but it does seem to have this sort of strange veneer of, well, we'll, we'll let them. Um, when... So yeah, when it comes to my own writing, I'm I'm very I'm I'm clear about it. I wouldn't criticise other people for what they do. They might have their own reasons. I find it intensely frustrating. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I do think we all have a responsibility to try and pull together. But at the same time, I'm not going to publicly criticise anyone who chooses to use the wrong pronouns. In my opinion, yeah, I was just a bit surprised about Julie Brindle. Yeah, oh, uh, regarding with just stating her her the way she uses pronouns basically and she'll refer to her i know she once called friends. paris lee's um i know she once said that he was a, a woman and was a lesbian which was surprising or yeah. could be a lesbian um I, I think her position may have changed i don't know um but again she's been in this a long time so i'm kind of reluctant to criticize her when she was speaking out um Having said that, I, I do think if you if you have a big platform and you're sort of you know pushing against this, you really ought to mm. try and try and just be honest about things. And it's not rude, you know. The truth ought not to be rude. And if you're offended by the truth, you've got a problem. I mean, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not other people's problem. You've got to be careful because it is very frustrating if someone that you agree with on so much does one thing you disagree with. Yeah, but if they if their good work out completely outweighs that, then you know with this on I don't know what it's like to be on the left but on the right there's just so much infighting then I guess done so it's just yeah. like welcome to the choose, turf choose your battles <laughs> but yeah it's been a pleasure to have you on wrapping up what is 
your book you're writing? Oh, um, so I'm, I'm co-writing a book mm-hmm. uh, with a, with a, a, a male friend, funnily enough, um, about pornography. Um, so um, I'll sort of, yeah, we're, we're basically looking at the... Um, the sort of the personal harms, sort of the whether whether it's addictive or not, we're sort of addressing that. Um, looking at the social harms, looking at the links with criminality, and also looking at the links between woke, for want of a better word, culture and sort of progressivism and pornography. Because I think there's been a, uh, I think there are lots of interesting ways in which pornography is potentially shaping some of the narratives that's coming out of the fringe left. Yeah, mm. and when's that? Well, (laughs) yeah, I I mean, I've I've only written two chapters so far. (laughs) Um, uh, My my co-author's written four, Um, so it's you. Let the man win. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think mine are better. Um, (laughs) um, It's it's, um, our deadline is February next year, but I'm hoping I'm hoping we can get it done before then. Yeah. So, get out yeah. for Christmas and I'll buy it for all my family <laughs> well, maybe, maybe like next Christmas yeah like Christmas after but I don't yeah. know <laughs> oh, well, 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 I'm really one looking forward to that other thing is um, if anyone was in more in- or a bit more interested in finding out about surrogacy concern yes where should they go and what should they so yeah, there are there are lots of good organisations sort of tackling surrogacy at the moment. So one of them is is surrogacy concerned. So you can find them on Twitter. You can find them across social media. I would shout out their Twitter. They're yeah, great. Good. Yeah, they're great. Um, and then there's also uh, Stop Surrogacy Now. There's Nordic Model Now, who are a prostitution, sort of anti-prostitution group. But oh, I think wow. they're also looking at this issue. Um, and then there's an organisation called Object as well. So yeah, there is a sort of growing movement. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, but I think we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, got to keep cool. busy. Thank you. Hi. But um, if people want to find you, find your work, where oh, can they look? Um, so I write a lot for Spiked. Um, obviously, I'm assistant editor at The Critic. Um, I had a piece in Telegraph today. Um, and um, yeah, I'm all over the place. So find me at uh, Joe underscore Bartosh um, on Twitter. Great. Cool. Thank, thank you so, so much. much. And thank you for watching. Bye. Bye.